So if that was going through one of the the blockbusters, uh, I thought I'd show you two of my favourite ones. This is what uh, these are two blockbusters that I grew up with. I spent um, disproportionate the large part of my <laughs> being a kid playing with these two. I'm not exactly sure what that made of me today, but this is <laughs> these were my two best friends anyway. This is He-Man and Transformers. Um, Sort of digging back into sort of the, the characteristics of these things and, and, and ways upon which you can think when designing games and, and fun, uh, I thought I'd take a step back to Anders Pyramids, because uh, this is one of the models that you can use called the Play Pyramid. Um, the idea is that it's, it's a toy design model so, we can so you can steer products in different types of directions. So any product at any given time would be inside this pyramid, and depending on the position, it would be sort of more skewed towards construction, challenge, sensory, or fantasy. And the idea is that you take a concept, perhaps, you place it in this pyramid, you know, metaphorically speaking, and you shift it to sort of say, what happens with this product if we make it more of a challenge? What would that entail? How would this product be changed in that case? What would be the benefits and what would be more difficult? Or perhaps it needs to be more construction-oriented. Um, there are several of these, these models around that you can use to sort of tweak and also to try to understand the, the, uh, the actual behind-lying characteristics of products that are already out there. You could take any, any toy or game that you like and you could place it within this pyramid to get a sort of an idea of the type of feeling or the type of emotions that they were trying to address. Um, another way of looking at it is, is segmenting things into different types of play. Um, and of course, there are many different ways of doing this. There are many models of looking at how to how to divide different ways of playing. But this is one of them that we chose to to work with. It looks like this. It's uh, it's five ways. Um, and this is interesting. And I'll get to to why this is interesting specifically for digital products. Is that it's it's very very different uh, how these types of ways of playing manifest in one world, and how when it moves into digi to digital world, that seems to change, at least in people's perception. So going through what this actually entails is that the first, first one is active play. It's being outdoors, it's playing sports, um, sort of like the cats that Anders showed from the beginning, sort of chasing each other about, sort of moving and being active in one way or another. That's a way of playing. Um, another way of playing is, is make-believe. It's more... Um, it's, it's dolls, it's fantasy-oriented, role-playing, maybe acting out scenes and one thing or another. It's very much uh, play with the imagination. Um, third one is manipulative play, which is more skewed towards puzzles and construction. Lego, for instance, is a good example of manipulative play. Um, then we have creative play, which is uh, music, arts, craft, painting, drawing, that sort of thing. Um, a large sector, of course. And then finally, we have learning play. And in this case, it's books and games. Because games um, are, generally speaking, fairly linear. You learn how to navigate through the Super Mario levels. You learn what to do and what not to do in order to, to move along in, in the game. So in a way, you, that's something that you don't intrinsically know the moment you open it. And there might be a slight variation of freedom, but more or less, if you want to finish the game, you have to go through that process, and it's something that you learn. Um, same thing with books, of course. The idea here is that kids like playing all of these types. Um, it goes through ages and stages. Of course, it varies a lot. Um, but as a rule of thumb, all kids like all, all of these ways of playing. And it just depends on, on their mood, or it depends on where they are in their development. So when we were trying to make sort of so, okay, so how can we make digital toys? We tried to say, so if this is the, on the backdrop of what we have, and this is how kids like to play in general in, in an offline world, what does it look like in an online world? So um, Emil, who did a lot of this work, uh, looked through the App Store uh, to see in the kids' games category what type of products are there. What, what's currently on offer, what's current, currently available. And this is one way of segmenting that. So it's, it's going from an interaction level, from being purely consumption in the top left corner, uh, moving into an easy interaction, and then going out into a hard interaction, sort of more, more advanced. Uh, it takes things like play and toys and moves that as it gets more and more intricate into gaming. Exploration and exploring turns into education, and creation turns into art. 
And sort of looking at, so, so this is one way of looking at different types of products. We, we, we sort of place them out and sort of see, well, well where are they all then? Uh, and then bearing this model in mind, sort of saying, well, okay, if kids like to do all these things, are these, all these needs and all these ways of, of taking on play, are they actually being addressed in the App Store? Uh, and this is what we found. Um, so if the size of this, um, these pieces sort of represent how many are there, it's about this many active apps or apps encouraging an active play about that's this many make-believe apps that stimulate your imagination and are driven by something which is maybe beyond the screen, something that is around the object where the, the screen, the iPad or the iPhone is only a part of what you're trying to, uh, trying to play with. Uh, I would say it's about that many manipulative games, construction-based things. Um, there's quite a few creative things, of course. There's a few drawing apps here and there. And when it comes to learning, it's about that much. And why could that be? So how come everything in the App Store so far intended for kids is skewed in this way? Well, one of the reasons could, could be, at least, um, that learning play, reading books and playing games, is the way that adults play. This is what adults like to do. When we, play, when we have time off, we like to read a book, and sometimes we play a game. Um, it's, it's, it's fairly similar. Very rarely do we sort of, we, we take out the masters of the universe and start playing with that in an imaginary way. Very rarely, sometimes, but not very often. Um, and there's something there, and I think when developing products for kids and specific, specifically trying to translate why these products initially have been so successful, you have to take a step back and think what are the genuine ways that kids actually like to play and then try to address those needs rather than just copying the actual products themselves. And, as, and, and especially not looking towards yourself, but rather looking towards the target group that you're after. It doesn't really matter what adults think is fun, it, what matters is what kids like. And trying to find that out and trying to take that knowledge into something which is very concrete. This sort of leads to, to um, Anders' last point in a way. Thinking sort of, so if we, if we now can construct these types of toys from these models and we can at least have an ambition of trying to address uh, a certain way of playing and we can sort of synthesize that and facilitate that through the, the creation of applications or even physical objects, of course. It's just the objects and the toys and the games are there in order to stimulate something, the ambition that you have as a maker. Um, but what, that ambition can also be, be very different. Um, often the ambition is, is um, to just make something which is really, really fun. But what would happen if we took a step beyond that? Um, we have this quote from the, the Blockbuster Toy Book who describes how these Blockbuster toys were thought through and what made them, what made them good. It says that many toy makers who invented Blockbuster toys did so not by following the pack, i.e. the money. Instead, they followed new paths that had yet to demonstrate their financial worth. They satisfied emotional needs that other toy makers had ignored. They found ways to produce smiles that others missed. So this is sort of something that's been inspiring to us, trying to find sort of, okay, so if we don't always, I mean, it's, there's a reason why all these, these books and games are doing well. They're, they're selling fairly well. There's a lot of them, but they're also doing fairly well. But it's inspiring for us to try to take a step back for that and not immediately jump into the pool where everybody else is, but trying to see if we can create our own, our own pool, so to speak. Um, and looking further, sort of what type of emotional needs might this be that, you, that we could be addressing? Um, these are a few of them. This is something that you could imagine at least that a toy or a game could have as an ambition to, to uh, address. How could we teach someone to be proud, for instance? How can we sort of make them uh, feel independent or even a sense of belonging? These types of needs which are natural for children in one way or another and that come through sort of daily life, but can also, if you have that specific idea and that specific ambition, be very uh, instrumental in your design to sort of see how could we accomplish this? How could we make kids feel or stimulate these emotional needs that they have? This leads me to sort of think of the, more or less, the absolute counter trend of what has been probably the most talked about trend within this area, which is gamification. 
Um, one definition of, of, of a trend is that it's not a trend if there's no counter trend. Uh, you know, if nothing goes against it, sort of it's, it's actually flying right in the face of, of a trend, then it's not really a trend. Which sort of prob possibly says that gamification is a very strong trend, because I'm, I'm, I'm arguing against it now. <laughs> um, it's that play is not the same thing as, as gamifying something. Um, and I think it's been clear, and I'm sure that you've all read articles about it, you may have read books, you may have read this little thing about gamification that Media Evolution has put out. Uh, it's a good read. For sure, it's a very interesting concept, and it's, it it takes up and sort of takes up how game mechanics can be used in order to make people do what you want them to do, more or less, or feel more a sense of accomplishment of some way. But um, so I think it, it's fairly fair to say that everything can be a game, but perhaps we should sort of allow us to think that maybe everything shouldn't be. Maybe everything in you know, even if it's possible for it, should not be led to think that everything has to be a game. I don't think we could sort of look beyond that and sort of have another ambition. And if our ambition was sort of greater with that, I'd like to sort of leave you with a thought that using play, what if we could address other emotional needs, like the ones that I listed before, and looking at the needs that are beyond just fun and winning? What could we use these, these tools of games, toys, and play in order to invoke for children and for adults?